All right, so we're holding tonight with Parshat Tetzaveh. I'm assuming that many of you, or at least some of you, have been to Disneyland. So if I were to ask you, can you summarize what Disneyland is all about? It's a little bit difficult because there are so many rides. But perhaps there's one word for it. Fun. It's all about having fun. The reason why I asked you about Disneyland is because sometimes people are not even aware what something is all about. They just partake, they just go for the fun. They don't realize what goes into something, how much work and how much talent went into creating all those rides. So it's hard for them to really see too much detail. For them, the big picture is fun. In Parshat Teruma and Tetzaveh, there's a lot of detail. Is it possible to summarize it? The answer is yes. The rabbis wish to summarize for us what the purpose of creation is. They don't really tell us the entire purpose. That is something that only God knows. But they do say that if we were to summarize what our eyes can see you know, from what we know, we would say that Ha'olam omed al shloshat varim that the world stands on three things. It stands on Torah, on Avodah, and Gilut Hasadim. It stands on the study of Torah, on abiding by the mitzvot of the Torah. It stands on the pillar of Avodah, the service of Hashem. And the third pillar is the pillar of Gilut Hasadim, acts of kindness between human beings. The world stands on these three, meaning that without one of those pillars, it would collapse. It will fall apart or it would not make sense for Hashem to create a world where either one of these three is missing. So there's a need for each one of them. Torah gives us direction. It's the laws. We need to know how to conduct ourselves. Man lives for 70 or 80 years, and if he doesn't get a head start in understanding just a little bit what is expected of him, he's going to make a lot of mistakes. The Torah gives direction for the Jewish people, but it also gives some direction for the non-Jewish world. It is supposed to be a light unto the world. A light meaning something that will illuminate, something that will show them what life is meant to be. Meant to be. Why do I say meant to be? Because if we were to leave the human being on his own without giving him direction, he would pretty much behave like an animal. As it is, many human beings behave worse than animals. But if we were to give him some sort of direction and tell him, listen, life is purposeful, life is really meaningful, there's really a lot that one can accomplish that can be beneficial for the human being and for the entire world. Not only during your lifetime, but for the future generations, what we would be accomplishing is hopefully shaping his perspective, giving the human being a clearer perspective. The problem, of course, is that there's a lot of religions and a lot of guides a lot of laws, and everybody seems to excuse themselves. Well, which one should I follow? Well, that's not an excuse. Because for those of us who understand what a neshama is, a soul, a spiritual soul, we realize that man is endowed with basic understanding of the difference between right and wrong, even without laws. It's just that if he's not guided, then he's wild. And a wild animal, as you know, if, unless you tame him somehow or train him, will act in a very, very wild way. So the human being, if you just give him a little bit of guidance, he has the potential to turn out to be a completely different type of creature than without direction. Some people are good by nature, they're born like that, or it's their upbringing, whatever you may call it, but there's no doubt in the world that if you give him some sort of direction, and point out what is really important in life. Early on in his life, it will make a big difference. His marriage might be even better because of that training, because of the upbringing, because of what the parents taught him, the values that they, they shared with him. All of these things make a difference. So when the rabbis tell us the world stands on three pillars, they mean, listen, it's a fact that if people, human beings, held on to these three, lived by them, the world would be a much better place. So Torah is guidance. 
Avoda is our connection with God. It's very important that one be connected with Hashem, even though some people claim they can live without God. They don't realize that they're not living by themselves. They live in a society. So even if they somehow succeed without having religion in their life, to be good people, to be kind-hearted, but what about the, everybody else? So it's not a good excuse to say, oh, I can do without it. Well, yeah, what about the rest of society? Society as a whole needs to be regulated. It needs laws, we realize that. And it needs a connection with Hashem. It needs that avodah, the service of Hashem, which includes prayer. It includes various other rituals that we perform. And number three, I think it's the easiest one to understand. Gemilut Fasadim, acts of kindness, is very important because people are not here just for themselves. We live together with other people. We cannot be selfish. And if we were to pay close attention to what is going on in creation itself, we would see that God is kind and does for us so much, and He wants us to emulate Him. And all of these three pillars, therefore, we see a little bit of what Hashem expects of us. Pillars meaning that this is what holds the world. This is what Hashem expects of us to support and to pursue. Last week we began to talk a little bit about the Mishkan. So the building of the Mishkan in reality is an introduction. It's an introduction to this Avodat Hashem, to the service of Hashem. In Pashat Tetzaveh, however, we see much more detail as far as the garments of the Kohanim, the Bigdea Keunah. How they were fashioned, what material was used. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, had eight. The Kohen Idiot had only four. It's very interesting. A lot of people, by the way, are bored by this. They don't find this interesting. That is why I call the series, the series, the lessons and the moral teachings of the parasha, because we're not just going to be talking about the words or the description. We want the meaning. We want the lessons. What can be learned from this? There's a lot of that we can learn from. There's a, a lot of depth to every detail. But in an hour's time, there's only so much that we can do. But the idea behind the clothes is that these were, you can look at it as uniforms. We all know what uniforms are. But we don't necessarily understand why uniforms are important. Why are they necessary? We just got used to it. We see them in schools. People have uniforms. We see police having pretty much a uniform. The army has a certain uniform of sorts. So we know what they're like. We don't really know why they're necessary. Bigdea Kehuna, the clothing that the Kohanim wore, had great significance. Not only were they important for the service, if they were missing, if the Kohen was missing one of them, the whole service, that whole job that he was doing is disqualified. It's a big sin. So it's not just a uniform. It is very, very important that the service, this Avodat Hashem that we're calling in the temple or in the Mishkan, be done with this Mikdei Keuna. Why? Why is it so important? So what is a uniform? A uniform, in its most basic, I guess, description of what it represents is it reminds us of our job, of our responsibility. The, the most basic way of understanding it, this is what it's intended to do. There is, of course, a uniform of that the kids were in school, what is just to keep them all the same. That is a slightly different type of uniform. Here we're talking about a uniform in an official position that is intended to remind the one who's wearing it, pay close attention to what you're doing. You have a very big responsibility. You have a very important job. And if you look at the Torah, when the Torah gives instructions to make these uniforms, this clothing, it tells us that they're intended to be lechavod or letifaret. They're intended to be for the honor and for the glory or for the beauty. What honor and what glory or beauty? For the honor of the Kohen to remind him, you have a very important job. Don't think that you are a janitor. You are a Kohen. You are entrusted with a job that represents the entire Jewish people. You are their representative. You are their emissary. And everybody is hoping that you do the right job, that you do it right. So it's lechavod, it's to remind the Kohen, don't be mezalzel, don't look down, don't do, be disrespectful, don't think of it, oh, it doesn't pay too much. 
Look at the job I have. I'm working so hard with animals, sacrifices, and similar tasks. No, this is lechavot. So the kavod is intended for the Kohen to remember that his job is important. And letifaret is intended for us, for the Jewish people, to see the beauty in this begadim, in this garment, and to remind us this is something that we should look up to. This is something that we should value. This is not just something hocus pocus. This is really, really significant. It makes a difference. So that is why there's detail that goes into the garments. The garments are beautiful and they're important. You have to wear them during the time that one is involved in the Avodat Hashem. Why does a Kohen have to be reminded? Does he need to be reminded? He knows he's a Kohen. His father was a Kohen. Why would he need to be reminded of, of what he's doing? After a while, you would assume that he just knows it inside out. He knows it by heart, as they say in English, with his eyes closed. So what does he need a reminder for? In halakha, in Judaism, Judaic law, there's a concept that comes up from time to time called hesech adat. Hesech adat means distraction. I think that's the best way to translate those words, to be distracted. You have to be careful not to be distracted at certain times when you're involved in certain mitzvot because you want to be focused. You don't want to, for example, answer the phone between putting on your tefillin on the hand and the tefillin on the head. That's not only a hesech a form of distraction, that is a real interruption that should not be there. So we don't look at our phones, we should not, for sure not answer the phone unless it's an emergency. There are certain things that we don't do when we're involved or occupied with something so important like prayer. You're talking to him. And it's disrespectful to answer the phone at that time. It's very simple, but some people just got so used to it these days that everybody carries a cell phone, as opposed to the olden days that you had to go to a, a booth or you had to go to your home to dial. So everybody carries a cell phone. So they think it's just second nature. You know, let me pick it up. This is the time of prayer. You cannot afford to have hesech adat, to be distracted from what you're doing. You were given now 40 minutes or so time to pray the shachrit, or a few minutes for mincha, a few minutes for arvit, the night, the afternoon, the night prayers. Make good use of them, because if you're not focused, your prayer is not going to be a good prayer. Very simple. If you're focused, you have kavanah, you have intent, you mean the words you say, it makes a world of a difference. People say, yeah, but I don't see the difference. You don't see the difference, obviously, because you don't have spiritual eyes and you're not in touch with heaven to see how the words made a difference. But we know words make a difference, the tone, whether you said it with a smile, how you said it loud or quietly in talking. We know that these things make a difference. People can see if you are serious or not. People can see if you are... Uh, if you care about them, all of this can be seen with words. So if we are distracted and we're not paying attention, not looking the, at the person while we're talking to him, people don't like that. So hesech adat, this concept of being distracted is very significant in the Avodat Hashem because if a person is too distracted, he, he disconnects. Instead of connecting, he actually disconnects. What happens when the Jew disconnects because of the Sechada, for example? Then everything that he's doing that once upon a time was beautiful and nice becomes ritual, becomes shigra, it becomes a habit. When something becomes a habit, some habits are good, but when these kind of things that are very important, undim beru moshe lolam, they are pillars. When they become just habit, then the prophets call that mitzvah anashim melumada. The prophets talk about this. They, cast, they chastised us. They rebuked us for this. Your rituals have become just plain rituals. Not, not really meaningful. You don't really mean the words you say. You just want to get it over with. That's the impression that a lot of kohanim, even priests during the temple times, at certain times, that is the impression that they, have, that they, they gave. They were perhaps more interested in the money, 
It was a very political job. There was a lot of issues, a lot of problems in those days. That's why it's no wonder that the first and second temple were destroyed for, for different reasons. Nonetheless, it could not go on that way because Hashem said, that's not the kind of house I had in mind where well, you're not focused on what you're supposed to do. Instead of strengthening that connection between the, the people and Hashem, the Kohen, the Kohanim were distracted, not paying attention to the details. So, Hesech Hadat, anytime one is distracted in doing a mitzvah or in the service of Hashem, it causes a weakening of that connection. However, to be focused is not enough. You also need to be constant or consistent. So you will notice if you read Parshat Tetzaveh, you will notice the word Tamid. Tamid always in Hebrew appearing, whether it's in the menorah, whether it's the korban tamid, whether it's in the hoshen associated with one of the garments, the word tamid is there. Whoa, what's tamid? You could say every day. No, it's emphasizing another important condition for strengthening that bond between the Jewish people and Hashem, and that's called kviot tamid. Be constant, be regular. Because if you're not regular, even though you focus at times, you come, you cry your heart out, yeah, but it's not every day. So what if it's not every day? No, no, it's important that it be every day because that's also, the constancy contributes to that bond. If it's not constant, it's just once in a while, it loses its effect. Now, what's interesting is that when it comes to relationships between human beings, you don't want to visit your friend every day. He's going to get sick and tired of you. Shlomo Melech says that. He says, uproot your feet from the house of your friend. Why? Because he may be too full of seeing you. He might be so full or satisfied from seeing you so much, he may come to hate you. <laughs> so, some good advice is that when it comes to human beings, you don't want to see them in their homes too often because then it becomes nothing special. We're not talking about family, of course. Family is family. You, you want to see each other. You want to participate in the somehow of the other. But friends, some people don't get the, the message that they're not always welcome. And the people sometimes don't know how to tell them. You were just here yesterday. <laughs> you know, it's like food. You eat something over and over again. After a while, you get tired of it. You can't have it. But that's not with mitzvot. With mitzvot, we have something to accomplish here. We need to accomplish. We only have so many years that, that each one of us got. And we need to accomplish. And the more, the better. The more we can accomplish, our, our, our bank account upstairs will be better, will be bigger will be fuller. It's very simple. It's logical. Plus, the more constant we are, we're not going to lose touch with it. On the contrary, we will get used to it and we will enjoy it more and more. So this is another important condition, not only to be careful with Hesechadat, is to make sure that whatever we do that means a lot to us, we do it tamid. A woman, a Jewish woman lights candles tamid, Erev Shabbat on Friday. If she misses, it's no good. So you have to be careful never to miss. You know, there's all kinds of stories of people who were challenged because either they did not have money or they did not have the, the means to be able to perform a mitzvah, and they felt bad. This will be the only time I missed out this mitzvah. How could it be? And they prayed, of course, to Hashem, and Hashem helped them. Somehow at the last minute, either they found the money or somebody offered them the opportunity to do this mitzvah. It, it really means a lot to make sure that we don't lose the opportunity to do a mitzvah, especially a mitzvah over it, a mitzvah that comes and goes. Poor man comes to your door. If you tell him, come back tomorrow, he may not be there tomorrow. He may need the money now, and if you're telling him, even if you have a good excuse, just remember that mitzvah opportunity may disappear may no longer be there, and you, and you missed out. Think about it as you just lost a million dollars, the same thing. It's even more than a million dollars. But people don't understand that, when we're going to talk about it towards the end, why people don't see the mitzvah 
as a million dollars. They should, because if they did, it would make a big difference. They wouldn't miss. So what do we have so far? We have Hesech not to be distracted. The Kohen needs to be reminded, needs to be focused. He has to do certain things to meet. He has to do things on a regular basis. And he needs the regularity so that he continuously remembers what he needs to accomplish. Not so much only so that he gets used to it, but also that he, he stays focused. The best way to understand this is with road signs. Imagine you're going on the freeway. You're going for a big trip. You're not paying attention to the road signs. You're not going to get off the right off-ramp. You're going to lose uh, the opportunity to get to your destination. If you only find out an hour or two later that you should have gotten out off an hour or two ago, what a waste of time to go all the way back. That's why it's important to pay attention to road signs so that we don't make such mistakes. So we need reminders. We need reminders and they have it in big letters so that you don't make a mistake. Sometimes it's confusing in the freeway. People need reminders. So the Kohanim would also need to be somehow reminded for example, with the, with the stones that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, had on, his, on the breastplate, he had the names of all the tribes. He says, I'm praying for all of them. I have to have them all in mind, not just my family. Yeah, the Kohen has a family. Maybe he's thinking about his family. No, you're carrying all 12 tribes. A reminder. And you think only the Kohen has a reminder? We have. The men, Jewish men have a reminder every day with the tzitzit. And if you see it, right, you're wearing it, you're seeing it, you will remember the mitzvot. We need reminders. Kohanim need reminders because they have a very, very sensitive job, much more than the average Jew. Where else do we see the importance of remembering? With Amalek. If this would not be a leap year, we would be reading Parashat Zachor around now. But Amalek, what does the Torah tell us about Amalek? Destroy him if you can, because he's out to destroy you. And remember what he did to you and don't forget. The Torah is telling us, remember and don't forget, because this is serious. Amalek is serious. Amalek is a, is a threat to all of humanity, not only to the Jewish people. Why do we have the mitzvah to get rid of Amalek? Because he's out to get us more than anybody else. Because what we represent, he hates. He doesn't like it. He stands in opposition to what, what we represent. Service of Hashem, mitzvot and ma'asim to him, be, be nice, be good. If you read Mein Kampf from Hitler, he says he's proud to be a barbarian. They're proud, those that follow that philosophy, proud of being barbarians. In other words, he's not ashamed of it. So here comes the Torah, and teaches exact opposite philosophy or way of life than Amalek. And people, when they read the Torah, those who are especially who are not Jewish, and they see the mitzvah of destroying Amalek, annihilation. They say, oh, how can the Jew do that? Well, look at the rest of the Torah, and you tell me if, that's the, if that is what the Torah is really preaching, to annihilate others who don't think like you. And of course not. On the contrary, the Torah teaches about caring, about being sensitive to others, regardless of their religion. So if it points to Amalek, then there must be some reason for it. So if, you, if people were to dig a little bit deeper into the mitzvah of the Torah, into the logic and reasoning, they would see there's, there's obviously some very good reason for destroying this nation. The job can never be done anyway. The Torah is reminding us that it's only going to happen when Mashiach comes. Hashem is going to have to do it. Evil which is a synonym for Amalek in a sense, will exist until Mashiach comes. Just get used to it, do whatever you can to not let it interfere in your life. And if you have any say in the matter, obviously, get rid of them. It wasn't done, unfortunately. Who had an opportunity to do it and did not do it completely? Shaul. What happened? Shaul got confused. Why did he get confused? He said to Shmuel, you know, Shmuel, you know, I just couldn't kill all the animals. What a waste. 
you know, we can use all the cattle of Amalek, which by the way has to be destroyed too, everything has to be destroyed. We can use it for ourselves, for our sacrifices. It's lo chaval, as we say in Hebrew, lo chaval. Isn't it a, you know, um, it's a waste. And what does Shem tell them? Tell me what's more important, to animals or to do what's right in the eyes of Hashem? Since when do you start making calculations, cheshbonot ka'ele, of chaval, what a shame, what a waste. Just follow his law. What did he say? Oh, I was afraid of the people. Politics. What are people going to say? I, I had pressure. Now, we can never, never judge Shaul. He was a tzaddik. He was a very, very special soul. So we don't know what we would do, so we're never going to judge him. But we have to learn from it. If there was nothing to learn from it, it wouldn't have been documented. Everything that's documented in the Torah, in the Tanakh, in the entire Tanakh, is for us to learn from it. There's something to learn. He made a mistake. The mistake was not following Hashem's clear instructions. Don't get confused. Don't be distracted. So that's what happens. The evil inclination, of course, the Yetzirah, that's his job. Distract you. Have fun. Enjoy life. They tell you you only live once. That's what they tell you. So therefore, what is the average human being going to think? Oh, I better enjoy myself. Really? So, Shaul HaMelech makes a mistake. And it costed him, of course, his reign, his position of being king. So, when the Torah tells us, be careful to focus on the threat of Amalek at all times and not to forget, it's basically telling us, don't lose that sensitivity for what Amalek represents for his threat. Don't say, ah, it's okay. He's a nice guy now. He wants to make a peace treaty with us. The Torah says, don't believe him. Don't forget what he did in the past. But that's in the past. Yeah. But the past should teach you about the future of Amalek. So you may say, okay, we don't know who Amalek is. That's true. Because today it's a little difficult to know who Amalek is. And I have a whole lecture about this. So I'm not going to repeat myself. If you want to know a little bit more of who Amalek is, it's available on the internet. Why is it such a mitzvah to destroy Amalek? And who is he today? Can we recognize him? And the answer partially is yes. But I'm not going to say no. <laughs> I don't want to mix the two topics together. Just bring out the point that Amalek continues to be a threat, just that he wears a different uniform today. Today he's, he looks different than he did 2,000 or 2,500 2, years ago. So you may not be able to associate him with anybody in particular because he's all over the place. Basically, it's a certain character, it's a certain philosophy that is against the Torah in every way possible. Evil. So if you see evil in the world, real evil, there may be some Amalek there. So don't lose that sensitivity to that threat, therefore remember it. So we're being told, remember, not forget, so that we realize at all times this is a constant threat. In Pashat Tetzaveh, in Terumah as well, we see that the importance of focusing on the job, especially of the Mishkan, or the tabernacle, involved the women as well. That also says a lot. The fact that we're involving everyone, men and women, means that this is of great importance to Hashem, the building of the Mishkan, the building of the house of Hashem. They're involved. So why are we involving them? Not only because it's important, because the Torah is teaching us. Remember, these are lessons. Everyone counts. Every Jew is important. No one should come and say, eh, it's going to get done without me anyway. They don't need me. There was once a little town that was known for its wine. And the king wanted to come and visit them because he heard that this wine was very, very special. Maybe it was Shirazi wine. <laughs> but uh, he wanted to taste the wine. He wanted to see how they make it. So they all got together on the day that the king was arriving and they prepared the barrel where each one, because they made their wine in their homes, would contribute a little bit to, the, to this barrel. It was a big barrel. So everyone would bring a little bit of the wine and together they would have a nice amount of wine. As, as the king was, was coming, they all got ready for it. The problem is that even though they got ready, they dressed up, some of them brought water instead of wine. They figured, well, everybody else is bringing wine. 
So it won't be noticeable if I put a little bit of water. So even though they got ready to greet the king, they did not really, really participate in the making of the wine. The problem is it wasn't one guy. Everybody thought of the same idea. They all put water. So when the king opened up the barrel, the faucet, and tasted it, this is water. It was very, very embarrassing. But you know, this is quite common that sometimes people try to get away with it. Eh, it's okay, it's going to be done. Let other people worry about it, let other people do it. If everybody's going to think like that, nothing is going to be done. Involving everyone, the men and the women, reminds us that everyone has what to contribute. Everyone is important. No one should say man is more important, or woman is more important. Everybody is important. Everybody contributed. It's something that's important for the entire Jewish people. So Hashem wants everybody involved. But why is there an emphasis on the women? Why emphasize them so, so much? The Jews being reminded the women played a very important role in Geulat Mitzrayim, in the Exodus. They had a very important role in that Exodus. That means getting the Jewish people out of that exile, in part, go, the credit goes to the women. Why? Hashem did everything. He, did, he performed the miracles, that's true. But how did they survive spiritually in Egypt? They continued to procreate. Which man had the calmness or tranquility or uh, state of mind to want to have children when those children are going to go to slavery, they're going to be killed? The men, therefore, were not thinking that that was such a good thing to do. They were easily discouraged. It was the women who encouraged the men. Let's continue having a family. This is our future. And of course, we have a tradition that one of these days we're going to come out anyway. Because of their encouragement, they continue to prosper. So they get credit. They get credit, the rabbis tell us, also for raising children because the husbands are not always around the home. Who takes care of raising the children, sending them to school? Women, many, many times. You know, in some countries, like in Iran, sometimes the father would be away from the home for six months, right? Yeah, right? Six months. They used to travel, I think, by donkey. Far distances, selling the, the shmatas, as we call them in Yiddish, selling the wares to all faraway towns. And Iran is a big country. Yeah. So they would take months to come home. Who would take care of the kids? The mothers, they get a lot of credit for raising the children, for providing for them, not only food and sustenance, but also Torah, whatever little bit they knew. The rest, of course, was done in the school. They, of course, have the job as much as possible to encourage their husbands today, too, because the men come home, they're tired. They're not interested in going to a shiur Torah. On their own, they may not do it. So it's up to the, to the wife to give that encouragement to the husband. And he'll, he'll realize this after many years, that he's gained a lot by doing so. What else? The women did not partake in the making of the Egel. We'll be talking about the golden calf next week, Bashat Kitisa. The men came and asked for the women's jewelry, the gold. We need gold to, to make this golden calf. No way, you go fetch your own gold. You give your own gold. We're not giving you our gold, our jewelry. So that's also to their credit. Besides all of this, the women were very good in some of the jobs of the Mishkan. To weave. Men usually don't know how to weave. It was more of a woman's job. So a lot of the functions and the jobs in putting together the Mishkan, not the service later on, but in putting together the Mishkan involved women. What do we see from this? Just a, a quick idea. In Judaism, men and women are equal but they're different. Very important idea here. Equal but different. There's nothing wrong with being different, we're just different. But equal. And because we're equal, no one should say that Judaism looks down at women. It's not true, it's totally not true. Just because there's a blessing that we say to men every morning, Shalom Asani Isha. We're thankful to Hashem that did not make us a woman. Of course we're thankful. Which man do you know that wants to give birth? It's painful. <laughs> That's not the reason we say that, that we're thankful. We're thankful because we have the opportunity to perform 613 commandments. 
613 commandments. There were two people that came for a job interview. On, uh, is it Hill Street and 7th, the jewelry district? <laughs> Somewhere around there. And uh, they want to be, uh, how do you call them, those that work on commission? Brokers. Brokers. They want to be brokers. Okay. So uh, the boss gives one of the, the two ten diamonds. Go sell. And the other one, he only gives two. The one who got ten complaints, you gave me more than you gave the other one. Why so much? It's harder work. You gave me more than you gave the other one. He says, you fool. You can make more money. You don't understand what you got in your hand. Ten diamonds. You can make more than that guy. You should be happy, not complain that you got more so much and so on. Right? People don't understand that we're talking about mitzvot here. 613, yes, we're happy and proud that we were assigned with that job because of the nature of man to do the mitzvot, whereas women do other things as well. So it's not about being disrespectful or looking down at those that don't have those opportunities. They have a different function, a different job. And we have a different function, that's all. We just have to show that we are proud. We have to remember that every morning. We remind ourselves, be happy that you were chosen to follow the Torah, that you were chosen amongst the nations to, to be an example for others. Be happy and proud of that. That's all we're saying. We're not saying others are worse, others are bad, others are, are, are not good. We're not saying anything like that. We're, the Jew is being reminded who he is, who he should aim to be. That's all. The woman, of course, has an important job when she gets married to lehashlim et azachar, to, com to compliment him because the two cannot survive well on their own. A man could not just do everything, cook, raise children, work. It's just impossible. So Hashem basically what he did was he delegated, he distributed the various functions in life to different people. So the wife received certain functions and the husband received other functions. That's all. So that they together can have a, fa a beautiful family where each one has a different role to play, but they're still equal. All right, now that we understand that everybody was involved and everybody contributed towards the building of the Mishkan, we've come to a very important concept that very few people understand. In this parasha, there is an emphasis that the main people that Hashem wanted to be in charge of the various functions and jobs had to be Chachmei Lev. When one reads the parasha and he says, Hashem wants Chachmei Lev. Chachmei Lev means those who are wise in the heart to create all the kelim, all the vessels to build the Mishkan. Why? What is Chachmei Lev? Since when is Chochmah wisdom in the heart? Wisdom is in the head. What kind of a term is Chachmei Lev? You don't find this anywhere. Chachmei Lev? And Hashem says, no, these are the people that are going to do it. Not only are these people the ones that are going to do it, I'm going to give them chokhmah. I'm going to give them a lot of wisdom so they, they should be able to accomplish this. So what is this all about? A very important condition, apparently, he says, I, I need chachmei lev. Literally translated, the word chachmei lev means talented. Oh, that's something that we can relate to. Of course, you need talent to make that menorah, that shulchan. You need a lot of talent. They didn't go to college. They, they were slaves in Egypt. How should they know how to build such a beautiful Mishkan? If you read all the details, it's incredible. How? So Hashem says, I'm going to choose the best people for this job. They're all going to contribute. Everybody's going to have a part of this very important and beautiful mitzvah. Yes, but the main people in charge are going to be Chachmei Lev. Talented people. But why are they being called Chachmei Lev? First of all, we're being reminded here by the, the words, Hashem miletiv ruach chokhmah, that I filled him with chokhmah, with wisdom, that this talent is a gift from Shamayim. Whenever you see somebody who's very talented in some area, it could be music, it could be a voice, 
you could be a, an artist, painter, or whatever. It's a gift, Mishamayim. Even though, obviously, we can learn certain things, but it's never the same. Try, anybody, unless you're very talented in art, try to make a Mona Lisa one of these days. And I give you 10 years to do it. 10 years! I don't think too many people can do it. And it doesn't have to be the Mona Lisa, just use that as an It could be any beautiful painting. Unless you're really born like that with the talent, with the, with the skills to create something like that, it's very difficult to even learn. It's very difficult to learn. Of course you can learn to become a painter and, and draw something beautiful, but it's never going to be the same as someone who's talented. I'll give you an example. I play piano. How do I play piano? Because I studied. I read the notes and I can play. There are some people that play by ear. They don't have to look at notes. You know, let them hear a song and they'll start playing. How do they do that? They're not reading notes? It's, in Hebrew we call it a hush. It's a certain skill that they have that they're just able to pick up and move their fingers around and play beautiful music. We must recognize, therefore, that when someone received a, a gift, Mishamayim, what is it? Why? Why did he get it, not somebody else? Because perhaps that's part of his mission in life. If somebody has a billion dollars that Shem somehow made him have, obviously that's part of his mission. Let's see how he uses that money. He's been entrusted the money of so many people because he has more than them. Not because he deserves it necessarily, because he has a mission. Most people with that kind of money are not going to think like that. Oh, I worked hard for it. Or he might say, I was lucky. Yeah, because there's no connection to Hashem. And even those who have a connection to Hashem are not going to always remember that. Because the evil inclination for money is very, very powerful. Remember John Paul Getty? Very wealthy man. They asked him, John, how much is enough? He says, just a little bit more. Ohev kesef lo izba kesef, Solomon tells us. Whoever loves money is never going to be satisfied. He's always going to want more, 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 more. What for? <laughs> it's just that the evil inclination when it comes to kesef is very powerful. It's one of the most powerful inclinations that people have. So here, the Jew is being reminded, Kibalta matana mishamayim, you received a gift from heaven, a certain skill or talent. Use it for, for the right things. Use it for the Mishkan in this case. But, not everyone received this gift. You have to be worthy of it. You have to be qualified, of course. But you also have to want it. People who had the willingness to help Hashem help them. Somebody that hesitated, didn't want to have anything to do with it, was lazy. Hashem would not give him all this chokhmah because he's not predisposed for it. He'd rather not do it. So who does Hashem give chokhmah? To somebody, of course, who's worthy of it, but also somebody that wants to do it. Betzalel, who was a, a young man, I think about bar mitzvah age. He was the main guy in charge. Why did Hashem give it to him? So there's various midrashim why Betzalel was chosen. But one of the explanations is he very much wanted. He was excited about it. He wanted somehow to be involved. And Hashem says, this is the type of people I want. Those who are excited and want to do it. Then I'm going to give him the know-how. But I need people who really want it. Now, because if there's no willingness to help, if there's no willingness to really do it for the sake of humanity to help them, then knowledge could be dangerous. Where do we see that? The nuclear bomb. The nuclear bomb is a very, very destructive power that did not exist in, in the same way years ago. Man has tremendous power. He can destroy the entire world today. Depends what his intention is. So knowledge, the knowledge that people have to create that is not enough. It's very good that people have knowledge. But how are you going to use that knowledge? You know that very, very smart people rob banks sometimes? They dig a tunnel in the sewer. I'm sure you've heard such stories in the news. It takes some intelligence. It takes someone being very crafty. But to do what? To steal. 
He wants to steal all this, the contents in the safe of the bank. So he's after money. He's using his intelligence in a very negative way. Nothing has changed. As the Solomon tells us, en chadash tachat Hashemesh, there were always thieves, there were always corrupt people, there were always evil people. And of course, we always had good people too. But stop and think, if you were given this talent, how are you going to use it? So the Kabbalah teaches that when someone sees a certain predisposition or a certain skill, it could very likely be that the neshama is telling him, this is what you need to do. He, something is pulling him in a certain direction. It means that from Shemaim, they're telling him, this is where you need to be. You are the one to do this job. Yeah. You, there's other people who can do the job too, but perhaps you are more qualified. So that's how someone should think. That if he, he's being pulled to do something, Hashem gave him a certain skill and talent, perhaps he should use it in a very productive way. And that is the meaning of the pasuk, Kabed et Hashem mehonecha. The rabbis interpret that, give honor to Hashem from your wealth, from your fortune. What does it mean, mehonecha? Mikol asher Hashem hanan otcha, they say. The word honcha can also be interpreted hanan. From everything that Hashem has endowed you with. If you have a good voice, be a chazan. Read the Torah. If you're very good with people, you're patient, help, help out. Be a... Uh, a counselor of sorts. There's a lot of need for, for all kinds of skills that people have. The, the problem is that some of these people that may have the skills are busy tr trying to make more and more money because that's what they're in love with. You don't realize that you have the ability to help the community, help people in some way. Some way. You're a good cook. <laughs> Anything. Use that not just to provide for your family, of course, but use that in any way you can to be helpful to others. It could be that that's part of your mission. So chachmei lev, therefore, means what? Why is in the heart? Because they have a heart. They're, they want to do it. They're sensitive. Echpat lahem, we say in Hebrew. They care. Hashem says, these are the type of people I want, and these are the type of people I'm going to invest in. I'm going to give them the skills that they need because they care. I'd rather give that intelligence to people who care and want to do it than to those who don't want to do it. You want to have an idea of who doesn't want to do it? Bureaucracy. If you were ever involved in bureaucracy, <laughs> you know, if you had to depend on it, you know what I mean. You go to an office, oh, sir, you have to go down the block. You go down the block, oh, you have to go back to that guy. But he told me to come to you. No, you have to go back to him. And then come back tomorrow. And then you need this paper. If there's somebody that cares out there, in five minutes, he can take care of it for you. Sit down, I'll take care of it for you. I'm going to make a phone call. I know exactly who you need. I'll take care of it for you. How many people have you seen like that that will take care of it? They send you off. They don't want to deal with it. They'll come back tomorrow. Why? Because they don't care. They don't care. That's, that's the only explanation. I actually should say they may not even know that they can help you in two steps. They also may be ignorant. That's also true. If you really care, learn. Figure out. Do you have a book of the phone numbers? Is there any way that I can get more help from you? Do I really have to bother going there? Don't know anything about that. This is what I'm trained to do. Fine, you're trained to do this, but is there any way that you can help? After all, you have the phones, you have the phone numbers. Some people care, some people don't care. Unfortunately, there's too many people that don't care. So Chachmei Lev reminds us that Hashem wants people who care about this job, not just anyone. It is in those people that He implanted the Chochmah, the skills to do the job. Because they want to help. There are some people who love what they're doing. It makes a difference. If you come to them, they enjoy doing their job. They enjoy doing their work. It makes a big difference. Somebody just does the job because he wants to get paid. That's not a good. That's that's not good. There was one somebody that came to the Chazonish Rabbi. Uh, I'd love to be a teacher. I think that's a good profession for me. He says, Why do you want to be a teacher? Because it, they say it pays well. You're not going to be a good teacher. He tells him, Don't be a teacher. I don't want you as a teacher. Why not? 
a teacher should be someone that wants to teach kids, cares about them, you, doing it because it pays well. I think this is a classic example, really, of somebody that doesn't really have the kids in mind so much. He gave it away. He actually gave away the reason of why he wants to be a teacher, which is the wrong reasons. The more we care about something, the more we invest in it, the more we will be successful because we will have the patience to do it. We will not get tired of it. And the same applies to marriage. Have you ever seen a Fatani Kala, the groom and the bride, go to a chupa thinking of getting divorced? No. Usually when two go to the chupa, they want to be successful. They want to really be a good team. They want to raise a family. I, I think that's the normal healthy thoughts that a couple should have under the chupa. They, they like each other. They, they care about each other. Then what happens? Why does it weaken later on in life? There's a lot of reasons, of course. But it wouldn't happen so easily if the couple said to each other, we're going to do whatever it takes to succeed. Even though you have this kind of a background and I have this kind of a background, we're very, very different, but you know what? We're going to make it work. If the two people think like that, then of course they're going to make it work. But not everybody thinks that way because they're thinking more about you know, what is there in this for me? Instead of how are we, use the word we instead of me, how are we going to make this work? We both care. We want to, we want to both succeed. It's very, very sad, but the reality is the majority of divorces is indicative that marriages have failed. People have failed in doing what they could have done better. It's, it's usually not indicative that they were the wrong match to begin with. No. Matches are made in heaven most of the time you marry the right one. Most of the time you marry the exact person that you were supposed to marry. It doesn't mean that she or he is perfect. Of course not. No one is perfect. There could be challenges ahead. People sometimes are stuck with a partner that is not healthy, even though they're good, but they're not healthy. That's a challenge too. What if you married a, a man that doesn't have too much bacht? You understand, right? <laughs> well, what happens if he's not so lucky? That's it. I'm, I'm leaving him. But he's a kind guy. He's such a sensitive soul. He's a good father. So he doesn't have so much luck. So what? Look at the positive. If people really cared and they want to succeed, they would try harder. People today are not trying hard enough. So now we've reached a very important question. So where do we learn this ikhbatiyut? Where do we learn this care about? Where do we take it from? Rabbis tell us, Ezu chacham haro'et anulad. Who is a smart man? One who foresees the future. Not sees, foresees. Foresees meaning that before things happen, you can already foresee what will happen. So if you consider the consequences of your actions, you are a chacham. Your, your decisions are being based on calculating or considering the future, the various possibilities. So, Ezu chacham haro'et nolad. What's the nolad here? We're talking about the Torah, we're talking about the Mishkan, we're talking about the service of Hashem. What could be the nolad over here? That these people, or certain of people here, would be more sensitive and more caring about doing this job than others. What are they seeing more than anybody else? What's the nolad for them? The nolad is very simple, it's the tachlit. What is the purpose of all of this? They are chachamim, you know why they're smart? Because they know what the purpose of this is. They know where this is headed. They know what this is going to accomplish. Therefore, they say, yes, I want to be a part of this. When people are not learned, ma toelet, what am I doing? What am I accomplishing? My etzeli is they say. What's, what am I going to get from this? They don't see the nolad. Do you know what will be of your children if you send them to a Jewish school? You know what difference that will make in them? After they grow up, if they went to public schools, you, you don't have control over them. You have to pray day and night that Hashem should awaken them to do the right thing. And to just, throughout their life, you know, be good kids. You have to continue to because you have no more control, not as much. Give them the best you can while they're young, so something will stick to them. Why? Because that's Ro'et HaNulad. You're seeing, you know that children, whatever they get when they're young, have a better chance to hold on to it. 
So that's Roy et al-Olad. So Nolad is the Tachlit, the Tachlit, the purpose of building the Mishkan, the service of Hashem, the connection with Him, made a world of a difference. But if a Jew does not understand what the purpose of all of this is, obviously he's going to have a hard time. With Amalek, as we said before, Shaul made a big mistake because he did not see the Nolad. What does Hashem, why does Hashem want you to destroy Amalek in everything that he has? That's a very important tachlit. Don't you understand what the tachlit, what the purpose of this, of this mitzvah is? If you understand, if you had clarity what Amalek is and what he's trying to do, you would get rid of him. Even if he's a baby. Because that baby one day will be a monster. But you don't know it. You don't know that the baby will be a monster. How do you know? He's a baby. He's an innocent soul. But let's say somebody is able to give you future knowledge that this baby will kill a million people. Are you going to kill that baby? That's what the Torah does. The Torah says this guy or this nation is a threat. This is what he will do to you. Are you supposed to sit back and do nothing? Know the tachlit. If we know the tachlit, the purpose of the mitzvah, then we have a better chance of, of holding on to the mitzvah and doing it right. Amalek wants to call us off from our emunah. He wants to destroy the, what we represent. He's a real threat. Don't take it lightly. When a Jew cools off, unfortunately, that's what happens with the mitzvot. We eventually lose the cheshek. A Jew may have been excited once upon a time. He may have been in love with his wife. Same thing. It's the same idea. Why did it cool off? The cheshek cooled off. The ratzon is no longer there. The will is no longer there. He's no longer in touch with it. What remained is only knowledge, perhaps, but a knowledge without a heart. So you have a lot of learned Jews throughout history. You can read throughout history and you will see Jews who went off the path of the Torah. And they were intelligent. Yes, but what is good, the intelligence without a heart? If you don't care about it, you don't know the tachlit, then all that intelligence will not help. A lot of intelligent people who just went off the derech, went off the path. How could you go off the path? Don't you know the truth? <laughs> they know it, but there's no heart. They don't understand the tachlit, the purpose of all of this. In order to keep the cheshek, the pasuk says, Zekelim ve'an ve'om. We're being reminded that that cheshek, that desire, that passion that we have for a mitzvah, because it can cool off, just remember, Zekelim ve'an ve'om. Beautify it. Spend money on it. Show that you care about it because otherwise it may cool off eventually. Zekeli Vavel means don't buy a cheap etrog. Spend money on it. This is a mitzvah. And the more you spend, it's called hidur mitzvah. What's so special about hidur, beautifying a mitzvah? Rabbis tell us there's no reward for mitzvot in this world. We have it in the afterlife. But for hidur mitzvah, you do have sachar ba'olamazeh. Tehader. Beautify. Don't be cheap. If you're cheap on tefillin, cheap on mezuzah, cheap on tzitzit, cheap on shabbat, whatever. If you're cheap on the mitzvah, you're basically demonstrating you just want to get by. I just want to fulfill the mitzvah. What's the minimum to, to fulfill the mitzvah? Give me the smallest. You have an etrog for five dollars? That's what some people would ask. Etrog for five dollars? Don't you want the most beautiful one for hundred, hundred and fifty dollars? If you have the money, of course. Don't be cheap. Because when you are beautifying the mitzvah, as the garments were beautified, it leaves an impression. It is a very, very strong impression, and that's what helps the cheshek stay intact, because atame hader, you're beautifying the mitzvot. People sometimes have the habit of beautifying the external, but inside they're not beautiful. That's called tzviot, that's called hypocrisy. That's obviously not good. When we're talking about beautifying something, is making sure that you're beautiful from the inside too. Otherwise, to show off that you bought this big etrog, and the inside is rotten, it's no good. So the Torah is emphasizing to us that to make sure that the outside and the inside are both the same. They're both beautiful. I want to finish with a very important idea that a Jew can see how much they love him up, upstairs by how much he loves the mitzvot. If you want to know how much they love you, how much they really care about you, Ask yourself, how much do you love the mitzvot? If a Jew is excited to perform the mitzvot, he's always looking forward to it, that's a sign that upstairs they're happy with him too. Very easy. It's very easy to figure that out. How excited you are you about the mitzvot? 
If one is not so excited, it's obviously not a good sign. Let me share with you a quick story that I heard from Rabbi Nisim Yagen Zechet Tzadik Levracha of blessed memory, many, many years ago. A very painful story. There was a very religious father who approached him somewhere in New York in a well-to-do community. He says, Rabbi, I have a question for you. This is a religious Jew. You see that man across from me sitting in the shul? We're both same age. We both have kids. We raised a family, Baruch Hashem, in, in the same community. They went to the same school. We're both observant. Why is it that that man's son, when he grew up and finished high school, decided to continue his studies in the yeshiva in Israel, and my son, when he finished high school, decided to be a priest? What that means is that he decided to let go of Judaism. How could it be? I have a black yarmulke, he says, so does he. Kosher kitchen, everything the same, pretty much the same. Why should that child choose that, which is beautiful? It's the right thing to do, and my son not. He was very pained by it. So the rabbi says, I'm not a prophet. I don't really know, but I can guess. When that father used to wake up in the morning to go to pray, and the son would see his father, and he would ask him, Dad, where are you going so early? He says, I'm going to pray to Hashem. You want to come with me? When that son saw his father making a sukkah, building it, Dad, what are you doing now? I'm already getting ready for sukkah. Come and help me. We want to build a beautiful sukkah, a big sukkah. We're going to have a lot of guests. Anytime that son saw his father doing a mitzvah, he saw his father was very happy with it. As opposed to you, perhaps, perhaps when you got up in the morning and your son asked you, Dad, where are you going? Ah, I have to go to pray. He's tired, didn't tell his son, come with me, I have to. When you're building the sukkah, what, Dad, what are you doing? I have to build the sukkah. Where are you going? I have to go there. The son decided, he doesn't have to. If every time you reacted to a mitzvah, to that which is holy and special, you have to, your son decided, he doesn't have to. That other son saw the excitement in his father. And of course he was excited to continue to do what his father does. So. How you relate to your children, the example you said, of course, is very important. It's, you're, you're about to plow a field. You're about to plant something. You're investing in a field. Aren't you going to plow it? Aren't you going to remove all the weeds? Otherwise, it won't grow well. People have to do a good job in plowing, in preparing the field. And part of plowing means working on ourselves, on our midot, on our character. Otherwise, if the kids see husband and wife fighting all the time, once in a while, it's OK. <laughs> all the time? It's not good, because that, that's what they're going to see. That's going to influence them. But unfortunately, the attitude is what will make the biggest difference of all. And in order for the attitude to be good, I'm going to share with you a, a good, very good mashal that will help us a lot. Similar to the one I told you before with the diamonds, there was once a guy who arrived at a hotel with his diamonds. And you know, in some hotels, they have bellboys. And the bellboy takes your luggage, comes to your room, you give him a tip. When the bellboy came to this diamond dealer's room to collect his tip and to deliver him his luggage, he came sweating. Sweating. Oh, oh, you owe me a big tip. What big tip? Your luggage is so heavy. What did you put there? Large rocks? He says, you must have the wrong suitcase. Mine, if you know about diamonds, my little suitcase is so small, it barely weighs maybe two pounds. You have the wrong suitcase here. When one deals with mitzvot, if one complains, Kasheli yot Yehudi, as they say in Yiddish, is shverze zayin naid. Some people complain, it's so hard to be Jewish. That's not good. You know why he says that? Because he doesn't realize what he has is diamonds. If he were to remember that what he's carrying and what he's dealing with is diamonds, they would never weigh so much. If the mitzvot weighs so much, it's so difficult for me to carry and handle, that's a sign you're, you're looking at as rocks. Ah, it's so difficult. How could, difficult, how could it be difficult as diamonds? That is why David HaMelech reminds us in Tehilim, for those of you who want to look it up, it's a, mo, it's a very important verse, chapter 112. Fortunate is the man who is God-fearing and loves 
to do the mitzvot. The mitzvot of hafetz me'od. He very much wants to do those mitzvot. It will make a big difference because gibor zaro yebaaretz. His child will be strong. Dor yeshorim yevorach. Dor yeshorim yevorach means that he will see upright generations. He will have wealth, he will have happiness, and his righteousness will endure. And what those words mean is that everything that he has done will continue to the next generation. Gibori Yezaro means that his son will be strong. Where did he receive that strength? From his dad. What we see from all of this is that everything that we prepare for ourselves, at the same time we're preparing it for the future generations, for our children to come. That heshek, that desire, that interest, that care, that sensitivity. It's for us too, of course. We want to be like that all our life. But at the same time, we want our children to have that, to, to inherit that. This is a special blessing of sorts that the Vila Melech is reminding us. If you are chafetz me'od to do the mitzvot of Hashem, the mitzvot Hashem, your children will do as well. Amen.